Hello and welcome to Epicenter, a show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I am Meher Roy. Today we are, we are going to talk to Zoe Adamovich, who is the co-founder and CEO of Neufund. Neufund is a new way to fund ventures that uses the Ethereum blockchain and allow startups to access new kind of capital market, essentially. Zoe, welcome to the show. Hi, welcome everybody. Thanks guys for having me here. So before we start, tell us about your background and how you came to be interested in blockchains. Maybe I'll start with how I got interested in entrepreneurship because this is as important as blockchain. <laughs> um, well, I've always been an entrepreneur, technology entrepreneur, and maybe this is where one should start. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I started very, very early uh, with building startups, uh, somehow successfully, sometimes not successfully, but, uh, you know, like, um, like, like everyone in the entrepreneurship space, of course, I was, um, you know, often looking for funding. And this is a little bit where the story of, of, uh, of Neufund starts as well. Um, you know, interested in blockchain. Um, weren't we all interested in blockchain ever since we heard about it for the first time, right? Uh, you know, I guess that uh, the so-called blockchain enlightenment, so this feeling when you suddenly understand how it really works and you think in decentralized terms, um, I experienced, uh, you know, I started experiencing it when, uh, uh, when you know, when, when the craze started picking up in 2008, of course, because this is, I guess, the first time that we all started thinking, you know, like, what's wrong with these banks? And then, you know, the real thought of intermediaries and things like that, and the trust and the concept of trust as trust started to, uh, you know, be important for everyone. Um, but, uh, and, you know, and we had Bitcoin and Ether later and so on. So, you know, like as, as an, you know, I guess early adopters are simply adopting. So we started just getting and, and hold these coins. Um, but the real interest as an, you know, as an, as an, as in the urge to start contributing into this, as an, as an, you know, eagerness to, to co-create that system was for me actually when the, you know, shortly after Ethereum ICO and with the first ICOs craze, right? When this concept started picking up, because this combined with this, you know, with, with my kind of entrepreneurial career, um, you know, with this drive to build stuff, right? And find means to build this, to, to build whatever, to build whatever technologies, in fact, because, you know, blockchain is just one of many, many really great technologies. Um, and then you kind of see that there is a way to fund technologies without the need to, to, you know, to approach this, you know, extremely fragmented and complicated market of venture capital, this is this is when I when I kind of properly thought, aha, uh -huh, this is something that can really change the world, right? This is something where I can really see that one can do something and build something to lower the barriers uh, of entry for everyone who wants to contribute to create to whatever, right? Because you know, if you think of venture capital or any financial markets, the, the barrier to entry is really really high. Right. I mean, if you want to start a startup, you need to know the people. You need to you need to really put a lot of effort, and you need to be born in a certain country, <laughs> uh, ideally close to a certain city like San Francisco, right? To even be able to start. Um, public markets, you can forget about it. The, you know, the, the starting point is you need to have six hundred fifty thousand euro. <laughs> um, so this is when I started thinking, okay, there is something where we can democratize the access. Um, to building, yeah. Cool. Well, let's let's speak about Neufund uh, much more in in just a little bit. I think you probably meant to say 2013 before, no? Because somehow I I understood you got interested in blockchain 2008, which would be very impressive. No, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, with the 2008 of the with the failure of the banks, this is where one started questioning the idea of the intermediaries, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. And one started to think about the concept of trust. You know, this is I guess where we. Uh, I'm also a sociologist as background. You know, I did, I kind of was I'm a sociologist and a computer uh, programmer, right? In one, so you know, so these are. Uh, so, so, so these concepts are very interesting for me. Uh, but yeah, 2008 was when I was like, wow, what the fuck? I had money and now I don't. <laughs> it disappeared, you know, how is it possible? So, yeah. Maybe just briefly, so you said you started some companies before and, you know, some have success, some have not success. There was like one very interesting or maybe difficult experience you had in that time and sort of, you know, the biggest 
lesson you took away from that that informs how you go about things today? You know how it is with the companies. You do them for a few years and then you're done with it and then you want to forget. So maybe I'm going to talk about <laughs> the one that was here before Neufund because this is the one that I still somehow remember. Uh, and actually, it also in, it also was kind of on my way to uh, to, to come up with the Neufund idea. So, you know, the, the, the startup that, you know, by the way, the same co-founder that I have right now, we did together before, uh, was in the mobile space. It was a search engine. It was also like a deep tech company. We're creating a search engine for uh, for for digital items that don't have metadata. So you, when, how do you search stuff that does not have text, right? Um, and this company was acquired uh, by, a, by, a, by a public, by a NASDAQ-listed company, American Corporation. And, you know, for a while after that, we had to, um, we had to stay in that company as you typically do after an exit, right? You need to be at the company and be one of those executives. So, you know, from one day to another, I became one of the executives of a NASDAQ-listed company. <laughs> um, and... And this is actually, you know, while we were there for a bit more than a year, um, this company went through some, you know, rounds of financing on NASDAQ, right? As an issuing new share to get public money. And what was stunning for me is that within one year, when you're listed on a stock exchange, you can do this a few times. <laughs> and you more or less press a button and then, you know, people are signing up for these shares or not, right? And this is going really, really fast. And it is kind of relatively easy, you know? But when you're a startup founder, especially early stage, right? When you have five people team, let's say, and you want to get a round of financing, then it's going to take you six months minimum from the idea to have money until when the money is in your bank, right? And in the six months, the whole team is doing nothing but fundraising, right? So forget building products, forget anything. You run around the world with your pitch deck, you know, analog almost, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, and you need to just fundraise. The same investors, however, you know, that invest in the super innovative companies expect from us, the founders, that we create hockey stick growths, let's say within a one year of time. But six months of this one year, we're fundraising. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Because it's easier for Mercedes, it is easier for a huge corporation to fundraise than it is for the companies that are supposed to be fast and agile, quickly developing, right? So, um, and that is a uh, that is that I you know I was used to this uh, you know VC process. Um, forever because this is the process I was doing, doing and I always thought, aha, this is how the world works. But no, the world shouldn't work like that because this is kind of internally making no sense. Actually, one thing that we also need to disclaim here, actually, we should have done this in the beginning, is that so no, we, we're going to get to this in a little bit. There's this uh, thing, this initial capital building mechanism in Neufund, which is a little bit like an ICO, but works quite differently too. Mm -hmm. and, and both Meher and I participated in that, so we, we are not unbiased in this matter. <laughs> uh, Thank you guys for your contribution. <laughs> the world is grateful. <laughs> so yeah, you, you mentioned the, the, the issue of funding, right, raising funds, um, and, and Neufund kind of solving that problem. I, I remember you also mentioned at one point that initially you were looking at doing a tokenized VC fund like how, how did you originally have that idea and then why did it evolve into uh, this fundraising platform? So we always wanted to build um, Neufund as in, you know, the centralized stock exchange in a way, right? But the question was, the question was, you know, in order to build something like this, you need to kind of address two communities in the world. The blockchain community, right, on one hand, and on the other hand, this classical startup and venture capital community, right? Because if you wanna if you wanna create a tool or an ecosystem where anyone, and in particular not the blockchain companies, but you know, but the projects that, that are not blockchain related, it can be technology project, but it can be simply a coffee shop as well, right? Then you need to somehow open up the blockchain ecosystem to the rest of the world. And, and, you know, and we're thinking how to do that. And the first idea that we've had was like, okay, why don't we first kind of create a little classical fund internally 
you know, that consists of, you know, whatever classical VCs or angels and so on. And then, and then kickstart, you know, this whole process with it, right? So we will first, you know, invest in the companies that would, you know, that would ETO on our platform from that fund, right? To kind of boost them, to kickstart it. Um, but then we thought that maybe we should do an ICBM. <laughs> So the initial capital building mechanism or initial community building mechanism, actually, which is a uh, mechanism to uh, to attract uh, all kinds of investors, um, experienced investors, crypto community investors, VCs and so on to um, to this concept. Right. So we, so we ask people to reserve or contribute certain amount of capital into the platform. This is the capital that we that we as founders as the company we do not have access to. We're not spending it on any operations, but we also do not manage it into. Uh, we do not deploy it into the companies, right? This is what the investors do themselves. Um, but this is like a signal of like, okay, I understood what the project does, and in particular, if someone is you know from the outside of the crypto community, uh, you know, it forces someone to understand, okay, I understand how this project is going to work, and my eyeballs are on the companies that are going to ETO on the platform, right? So yeah, so you mentioned this tokenized equity fund, right? So you guys didn't want to do that for no. some reason, and then so can you just now uh, on a very very high level? Like Neufund, like what is the thesis of Neufund? Neufund, um, Neufund is like a decentralized Nasdaq. Okay, Neufund is um, first of all, first of all, it is like Nasdaq or like any other stock exchange because you need to imagine a world in which any company can IPO, right? Um, and the difference then between, you know, the, the kind of difference, very simple difference for companies uh, that, you know, that are doing an IPO on NASDAQ and that will do with us is that because of the, of the infrastructure of blockchain, we're massively lowering the barriers to entry, simply the cost barriers, right? In order to do an IPO today, you need to have tremendous amounts of money. So you need to be a huge company. You also need to go through a bunch, bunch of, you know, intermediaries like banks or brokers or, um, and, 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 and imagine you could do this without it, right? Imagine also that you could, uh, you know, do an equity offering and, you know, write a prospectus and it's not going to cost you $200,000 just to have it signed off. Um, and um, so anyone can do that, right? The other, the, so the utility that we have for, you know, for, for companies is that we have this equity token. You can go and you can say, you know what, I am not a blockchain company, so I'm not a token model. I'm just, whatever, a shoe producer, or I am a uh, drone producer, or I am Ledger, the hard wallet that we have. So I'm not a token model, uh, not naturally. So, so how do I do an ETO or an ICO? Well, you just take your share of a company and you put it on blockchain form of a token and then people sign up to this share by buying it. Um, so this is like an IPO. On the other hand, what we opened also for investors is that, uh, uh, you know, we imagine that people who do not necessarily have Ether or Bitcoin would be able to invest in these companies simply by, by you, with euros, right? And we kind of put euros for them on chain as well. Um, so that's one, you know, but the other thing, um, the other thing that is, you know, for us kind of the most important part as the crypto community people is that this is supposed to be a decentralized exchange. And what does it mean? You know, Nasdaq is owned by a, a company, right? <laughs> there is a company that is operating this exchange and this company is making revenues. And most of these revenues or a huge part of these revenues are coming from, uh, from, from fees that companies pay for, you know, registering the transfer, ownership transfer um, and, um, you know, brokerage fees and things like that. All of this blockchain is actually doing right for us, because if I am selling you my Bitcoin, right, then, then the ledger is taking care of the registration. So these fees are down. Um, and thanks to this, what we can do also is that uh, uh, we created this token model on top. So uh, every investor in Neufund becomes an owner of this ecosystem simply by acquiring, by investing the company is acquiring Neumarks, right? 
Yeah, so like I think like, the simplest way of describing Neufund is, yeah, as you said it, that's the perfect. It's like a decentralized Nasdaq or a decentralized stock market. Yeah, exactly. And like when I read the Neufund paper, I had I had exactly this idea that, oh, this is a decentralized stock market that allows companies to sell equity. And at some level, uh, because I because I come from India, I get the value proposition of this thing uh, very very quick, very like in a in a way that I think many people in the West might not. So it's like in in a place like U.S., capital markets work really well. <laughs> you can issue bonds, you, you can issue shares, and if, and for many in, intents in, intents and purposes, they do work, but when we go to an emerging market, uh, capital markets are not that efficient. Uh, they, especially capital markets don't want to fund risky ideas, really risky game-changing yeah. ideas. Yeah. That's the domain uh, of venture capital. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even, even when you go to emerging markets, venture capital is highly un un underdeveloped. Like venture capital is underdeveloped and venture capital itself is conservative. And... Like when I see Neufund, I'm like, okay, can we marry the the risk-taking, pioneering spirit of like crypto ether holders or or, or cryptocurrency holders that are willing to take a lot of risk with actually uh, companies that need access to capital? And these are mostly like to me, these are definitely there in the in the emerging markets. Yeah. yeah. So it's like Neufund is the place where like these two things can yeah. can match. So you know, first of all, you know, can we marry? Let let me answer this question first. I think we definitely can marry these two uh, because while you are right that certain uh, you know venture capital firms have become very conservative, and indeed the business model of venture capital is such that it only funds certain type of ideas, and this is the so called unicorn, right? It doesn't. Um, uh, the there is a lot of uh, you know venture spirit among venture capitalists still, and I guess this is well proven by the list of investors that we have announced, right? I mean, we have like an amazing community of both VCs, business angels from the classical world, also from private equity firms and investment bankers, and we also have crypto community, and we also have you know Oscar-winning movie producers. So it's like a so I guess the the you know there is a lot of venture spirit among different people, but. It is now chained in what the venture capital as institutional investors have, have, you know, have kind of locked up themselves with, right? Because they have their business case and they can only fund stuff that fits this business case, right? And that caters to the needs of the, their LPs. Um, but, you know, there's so many cases, uh, use cases, right? Emerging markets, you're completely right. So... Because what we are actually doing is we're doing it very easy for any company to issue shares and for any investor to buy them. This is, can work really well in, you know, in both uh, emerging markets where these, where, these, uh, where, where, you know, where these capital markets are not operating that well. But it also is a use case for, you know, for very well operating capital markets. I'll give you an example. You know, I am sometimes a business angel and I like funding nice ideas. But, you know, there, if there is a company doing a B round or a C round, and let's even imagine it's a company that is struggling, right? And I really like the company and I want to give them my 100,000 euro. Nobody wants my 100,000 euro. <laughs> because if you are in a B or C phase, then, uh, then, you, then there is a board and there is, again, some kind of structure and there is a ticket size and there is a syndicate building and all of that, right? So you see companies fail just because they didn't find someone who would give them a 10 million euro ticket. Fair enough, but if they could an offering, you know, with like <laughs> smaller tickets, then maybe they will get this 10 million euro, you know, from a lot of people. But these mechanisms don't exist. There's just no way, you know. So before we go further, let's let's define what an equity token offering is on, on Neufund. You know, you simply say, <laughs> Let's imagine that you are that you know nothing about smart contracts and things like this, even right? So you you go to some kind of interface, a Neufund interface, and then you say, you know what, I plan to sell, uh, you know, uh, five percent or ten percent or fifty percent of my company's equity because I need funding and I'm issuing a certain amount of shares. Uh, you configure an agreement between you and the shareholders. You press a button. 
and the system spits out a smart contract, a token that contains these uh, terms, right, that you offered. And then people are buying this using cryptocurrencies or uh, uh, or like or or Europe. That's it. From the utility level, there is nothing more. Of course, it's extremely complicated to set this up, but uh, but the utility is just that. Yeah, I mean, what I like a lot about this as well is, you know, with ICOs, they have become this huge thing, and lots of money has been raised. And so there's all these projects and all these companies that are like, oh, this is great, right? Now oh, we can have access to this, like, wide range of people and, and, and sell my, you know, sell my product, sell my vision, sell this company, raise lots of money, build this community, right? Mm -hmm. and, and of course that's true. Um, but the problem is that very often, or, or I think this, this kind of model of having a token and a business built around this token, it works well in some cases, but it doesn't make any sense in, ma in many cases. And perhaps a majority of cases uh, that we are seeing today doing ICOs, right? So I, I think it's like people basically trying to kind of shoehorn this thing into the ICO to kind of ride this wave. And that's, that, I mean, I, I have many, got many such, you know, requests of like people who have no clue and like, I want to do an ICO too now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? There's this legal issues, which, you know, maybe can be solved, but there's sort of lo lots of problems with it. And that's just the nice thing about having this kind of equity token offering, because equity is a much more general thing, right? Equity makes sense for almost any company. Yeah, it's like a universal token, right? It's not like an abstraction about above token models, right? It represents any business, not just some project. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and of course you also have the, then the rights and obligations of a, of a equity with it. Which again, in some cases, if you create this revolutionary decentralized protocol, maybe it doesn't make sense, right? Maybe you really want to have a token and really want to do something like an ICO. But in many, many cases, I think something like an equity token offering makes much more sense. And so then you can basically maybe still have access to a very wide community. You can kind of publicly uh, sell this project, also build, have this community uh, building aspect. Also have the aspect of liquidity, potentially, you know, very quickly, but without having kind of the negatives or the things that will fit with ICOs. So that's one of the things that I found very, you know, kind of appealing about, or find very appealing about the, the vision and, and the product of, of Neufund. Yeah, no, you're completely right. I mean, this is a uh, uh, this is this is exactly what we're trying to achieve here, um, and you know. Um, a share per se is not a bad concept, right? It's like one of the greatest inventions of humanity, I think, and it's actually not so old. <laughs> um, and uh, and you know we're kind of trying to to innovate it even further because you know of course uh, smart contracts are also giving us you know a lot more tools to to kind of innovate on the concept of share. Uh, you know you can combine you know equity tokens with utility tokens right you can give certain type rights to your shareholders that maybe you couldn't you wouldn't be able to give so easily or at least execute upon so easily uh, with regular shares uh, you know that you can you can create all these governance models and so on so this is this is um uh, this is certainly amazing and uh, and you're right I agree with you that it's a uh, Today everybody wants to do an ICO, and I also receive calls from people who are asking me, "Hey, can you do a, you know a token model on top of my you know whatever bar, right?" <laughs> Which is just doesn't make sense. It's a bit like when Web 2.0, when every company was turning the customers into the community. Remember those times when you were a Vodafone customer, and suddenly they would be creating a community of customers for Vodafone, right? And then it was all gone. So I think we, we perceive the same with the tokens today. Nonetheless, you know, as, as much as there is a lot of, you know, um, the ICOs have gained a bit of a bad reputation as well because there were these, you know, huge rounds and sometimes scammy models. Um, it's kind of normal that wherever there is money, there is also scammers. Um, it's not only the domain of blockchain, it's like this everywhere. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 sh the sheer process of, you know, raising capital this way the ICO process and, uh, you know, the, backed by blockchain where everything is so cheap because blockchain takes care of so many things like payments, like transfer of rights and so on. Um, 
it's 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 great, right? It's great. We should just uh, clean it up and make it better. So even though the blockchain gives a lot out of the box, what are sort of the hard challenges in building Neufund? We need to work with changing all the mindset. You know, I think that uh, you know the, the technical part is of course a challenge. Um, but you know, there's many, many complicated, complex projects, um, and you know, Neufund is just one of them. But you know, what is what is challenging sometimes is uh, you know, I still need to run around the world and fight with the perception of blockchain as, you know, or, or Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general as as the money for drug dealers and stuff, right? I still need to fight with the perception that we are trying to build something illegal here, you know? So, you know, I'm posting something about Neufund and people just out of the blue ask me, oh, is it another pyramid scheme? I'm like, read your white paper. I mean, there's nothing about pyramid, right? But, you know, this perception is there. Um, and, and you know, you know, even people who are willing to participate, you know, they have this reserve, right? Uh, the reservation, they, they're, you know... The, they want to figure out whether this is legit, and there's a lot of explaining um, behind that. So I think this is the main main focus. Um, and the other is, you know, the world is actually not completely ready for blockchain yet, right? We see this on the regulatory level. Uh, there is a lot of movement, and it's uh, and it's great to see that you know a lot of countries are adapting to it. But this is this is a task that this you know that it's not my task. It's the task of the whole community and the whole world um, to adapt to this new. Well, phenomenon blockchain is a fact. We need to deal with this right now. Um, so that's another another challenge to be able to be agile within this ever changing landscape. Just just sort of two two more things I wanted to kind of bring up regarding these interesting maybe intersections because you brought it up briefly as well, right? Between equity tokens and, and ICOs. So one of the Things if you look at equity, how equity is being raised by startup, you have this kind of fixed structure at your seed round and series A rounds, and it's all kind of done in a very uh, kind of standardized way. And of course, if you look today at, uh, at ICOs, we have seen an explosion of different models with like auctions and Dutch auctions, and reverse Dutch auctions, and like cap sales and uncapped sales, and then all kinds of stuff. And and I, I don't know if this is going to be feasible in Neufund, but it, at least technically, it seems like it should be quite trivial to allow kind of plethora of, of different funding and pricing and sales model and structures as well. Are you planning to, to build that or, or, or will it be possible for people to basically implement their own sales mechanisms on top of Neupond kind of without restriction? Of course. I mean, you know, uh, what we actually are, if you, you know, go a bit deeper than the sheer utility level, then we are a uh, universal fundraising protocol. So, you know, the, our kind of specialty is this equity token and the fact that there is an agreement and the terms of an agreement that there's somehow typical or standard for VC rounds. So, you know, there's vesting and drag alongs and tag alongs and liquidation preferences and so on. So we provide the tool set to configure this kind of agreement um, and spit it out as a token, okay, as an offering. But, uh, but you know, we support also we can support also, uh, you know, any kind of tokens, utility tokens, staff tokens, combined tokens, and things like that. Um, and through this, of course, you can also combine any kind of, uh, really any kind of offering. I mean, as, as long as it is not illegal, and this is the only part that we actually take care of, that it must be, you know, something legal, you can do... You know, you can. By the way, on the on the public markets, you can do this to some extent as well, right? You can um, you can have a cap or not. You know, um, so any kind of models are possible. Just that it will be always for equity. Great. So let's speak about this initial capital building mechanism because this is also one of the things that yeah. Meher and I talked that we yeah. we really liked. It's just because it's favorite, the game. Yeah. <laughs> the game theory is very clever. <laughs> so can you explain what, what is this uh, ICBM? So, um, intercontinental, ballist intercontinental ballistic missile, some people say, <laughs> initial, uh, initial capital building mechanism, uh, some people say, and we also often say, I like to say initial community building mechanism. Um, and why? Because it's not about creating a capital pool, because you know the whole crypto community is the capital pool, and actually also with our interface to the euro everyone who has money is a capital pool 
right? Um, but but what we are trying to build around Neufund is a community of people who are both who are all early adopters, technical in technology investors or developers um, who understand tech products because that's what we start with. You know, we can also, of course, at some point ETO a factory or a bar, but at the moment we're focusing on the technology projects. Um, the way it works is the following. We are in a way, although we are built on Ethereum blockchain, we are in a way a separate blockchain in the sense that uh, on an abstract level, right? Because uh, the way, for example, Bitcoin works, as we all know, is that there is miners or many other blockchains, but let's focus on Bitcoin for a second. There's miners who are contributing the so-called useful work to the to the ecosystem, or if, and for contrib this is the mining, right? And for contributing to useful work, um, they're once in a while, based on an algorithm, getting a reward. So once in a while, they're mining themselves a Bitcoin, right? Um, and there is a limited supply of those, uh, but you know, but the whole ecosystem is, you know, it needs these miners to be sustained. Um, and we're thinking, okay, what is what is the useful work, right? In, an, in a fundraising ecosystem. And this is, of course, the act of investment, right? So, so the way Neufund works is that uh, if, 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 you know, if, if you are investing in some kind of ETO that happens on the platform, so you buy a share in a company, right? You're contributing the useful work to this ecosystem. And for that, you get a reward. And this reward is the token of the ecosystem itself, which is Neumark, okay? So every investor who ever invests in the company in the, on the platform is, is becoming a co-owner of the ecosystem, of the fundraising ecosystem. Neumark is giving you two things. You know, our business model is that uh, you know, whenever there is a successful ICO or ETO, actually, then the company pays a percentage uh, into the ecosystem um, of the success fee. And this, and this is going... Uh, to the Neumark holders, right? So if you have a Neumark, then you know with every successful ETO, you will see some actual Ether or Euro in your wallet. The, the Neumark gives you this fee in two components. One is the Ether or the Euro, so the cash component, but also the other component is a little bit of the tokens of the company that has done a successful ICO, right? So with this, the whole ecosystem kind of distributes, you know, the the success, you know, uh, its success all the time to the holders of the of the Neumark and builds like a portfolio as well of uh, of tokens that also belongs to the ecosystem. Every whenever someone invests on the company, becomes part, becomes co-owner of this portfolio, and also kind of gains the right to the proceeds from any successes that are on this platform, right? Um, this is how the platform works. Now, right now, we are doing the ICBM, which is like a special offer, the initial community building mechanism. And we are telling everyone, listen, if you reserve some capital on the platform that you will later, that you later intend to commit or invest into the ETOs on that platform, then already today, you're gonna get some Neumarks. You're gonna already to then become the co-owner of that ecosystem, right? So today you reserve some capital and you get the Neumarks. In the future, we'll have to invest some capital to get the Neumarks. But the idea is to start already today, you know, initiate this distributed decentralized exchange this way. Yeah, so, so basically, right, the, the logic here, uh, if you just sort of want to walk through it is, is this okay. So we could today say, right, so me and Mehu both did this, right? Say, okay, we're going to basically put some Ether into this platform, right? Now, this Ether is still Ether, but it's sort of locked in this, uh, you know, Neufond smart contract. And it's still uh, held sort of by us, right? And, and then in addition, one gets some of these Neumarks. Now, uh, Let's say in the future, there's some great projects. One can basically invest that and get equity in, in those projects. Uh, let's say Neumark uh, or Neufund, uh, maybe there's no projects that we like. Uh, then there's the option of basically destroying those Neumarks and withdrawing the money and paying kind of a 10% fine. Or uh, if it happens before 18 months or after 18 months, withdrawing the money and no fine. 
So it's sort of, if one has ether, the logic, at least from my point of view, if one has ether, it's almost like, it's like an option on the success of Neumark. That's right. Uh, of Neufund. Yeah. Uh, so that's very clever, right? Because on the one hand, one gives people this kind of like option to put money in. And then of course that builds uh, already kind of a pool of capital that can then be invested in projects. And I, I imagine that will also be very beneficial for, you know, if companies are interested in doing this, okay, they see already there, there are people on there who are sort of now waiting for something to do with their money, right? Because it's sort of allocated for the platform. Yeah, uh, exactly. And uh, uh, yes, and, you know, also in this ICBM, uh, you know, we are, you know, we have representatives of many funds, we have representatives of PE firms, uh, you know, and many professional investors as well. Um, so that, of course, you know, um, any project that's going to ETO is going to get attention of this crowd uh, immediately as well, right? So that's an additional value. Yeah. Cool. So, so in, in some sense, as an owner of Neumarks, um, that that single Neumark that I own is uh, is a is is sort of a claim on the future fees generated by the platform, and also the future tokens in various startups mm -hmm. that are going to be part of uh, part of part of the community pool. Yes, yes, and this is also the difference between you know uh, let's say Nasdaq and us, right? Because here, every investor who has a Neumark. And indirectly through this own Neumark participates in the success of all companies that will ever ICO on this platform, right? In Nasdaq, if you buy a share, you just have one share, but you do not participate in the whole portfolio that Nasdaq has. Here you participate in the whole thing. So, and the thinking behind it was like, okay, whoever contributes work to the ecosystem should be rewarded, you know, should should, should participate in the overall success of this ecosystem. Yeah. So what is the kind of governance of Neumarks like? So, for example, is the supply of Neumarks fixed? Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Can tell, tell us about like, you know, the supply of Neumarks and like yeah. the governance of Neumark. Uh, there, so there is a limited supply uh, limited to the equivalent of 1.5 billion euro invested. So the thinking behind that limitation was, uh, you know, how much capital do we think we need to incentivize uh, with this Neumark reward to, 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 you know, to get this going, right? How much money is competitive to start with, you know, like to, 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 to you know, to, <laughs> to, 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 make, to start, you know, hoping for this to become the, you know, the fundraising ecosystem of the world, right? Um, and... Um, um, you know, if you with every euro invested on the platform, the Neumax become more and more expensive. So for the first euro, you get more Neumax than you get for the second, and so and so on and so forth. Yeah. So there's also this company called Fifth Force KMBH that mm -hmm. has a role to play in 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 Neu, in Neu Fund. Yes. So tell us tell us about like Fifth Force. And its relationship to Neu Fund and then to Neumarx. Yeah, so uh, uh, you know we're bridging, we're trying to bridge the world of the classical and the world of blockchain. You know, so uh, um, we need to operate kind of within the infrastructures and ecosystem that exists today. And so yes, we had to found found a company. It's a limited company that is you know where there are people, they're developing the software. Um, uh, you know, and and um, there is an office and salaries and so on. And we think of this as a, uh, you know, like as an initiator, <laughs> as an initiator of this ecosystem, right? As, as a company that had to be there to kickstart it and create it. Um, and uh, Fifth First is like an operator. And the, 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 the Fifth Force uh, lives, um, you know, is, or is dependent on the success of the whole ecosystem in the sense that, you know, with, with every euro invested on the platform and every Neumark issued, the fifth first gets, gets another Neumark, right? So we hold some of the Neumarks, uh, some of the Neumarks that are created. Um, now, the idea for the company, for ourselves, is that, uh, you know, we would like to, at some point, decentralize this whole thing altogether. So we're not thinking about some kind of classical exit as a startup, but 
what we would like to do is uh, the moment there is enough movement and, the, and enough revenue and fees to, you know, to, to make this independent from any external sources of capital, we would like to actually ETO fifth force on this platform itself, right? And decentralize the whole thing completely. Um, and then, of course, we will introduce some, you know, some, some governance models that would be completely decentralized as well. That's the vision, right? Whether we're able to achieve it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. I have to say that is, there were sort of two aspects here that I, I felt like, you know, were sort of problematic or potentially problematic. So one is what you put, uh, put now, right? Is that essentially a fifth force gets, you know, for every Neumark issued to an investor, a fifth force also gets Neumark. So since this is sort of, you know, the claims and all the future of this ecosystem, you know, half of those basically go into one company. So that, you know, it's kind sort of like, it doesn't feel very decentralized. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's also just a question of simply, you know, to, to what extent is there like a dependency on that? And, you know, maybe when does that dependency go away at some point? Right. Because of course, if you look at something like Ethereum, sure, I mean, there was also uh, a dependency on the Ethereum Foundation. But, you know, even once the network is launched, I think Ethereum would have survived without the Foundation, probably. And uh, so it wasn't that long. My question is, like, how long is that dependency going to be here? Or is there any way of, you know, actually getting rid of it? Maybe because of this bridge to yeah, the existing yeah. legal world, it's yeah. harder to do that. No, I mean, of course, I mean, so we want to get rid of it, right? But we, one has to start somewhere, you know, and it is, um, and, uh, and you know, in today's world, it would be impossible to start a business without incorporating, you know, that's how the world works, unfortunately, at the moment. So, you know, so that, so the on-chain only organization has tremendous, uh, you know, regulatory problems, I don't think we'd be ever able to, uh, to pull this off. But um, so, you know, so as I said, the idea is that, you know, eventually all Neumarks will be in the circulation, right? Because we're going to ETO the whole company. You're going to ETO the gay and Beha. We're going to be completely public and community owned. And then, you know, the community is going to govern all Neumarks that are in the circulation. Um, so, you know, while, uh, while this, you know, while, yeah, some people say, okay, but you hold half of the Neumarks. Well, yes, this is true. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, we are taking, we're not an ICO, we're not asking community to give us any money, right? We never spent a penny of the community on any of these operations, you know? So we are, we needed to find some kind of way to finance these operations without asking the community for donation. Um, and, and at the same time, we wanted to balance it in a way that we would be dependent on the platform success, you know, so we're fully incentivized to grow Neufant ecosystem because we are dependent on the success of it because we are going to operate from the, from, from the fees, from the success fees of these ETOs, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, that, I think that is that is nice in that, uh, you know, there really is kind of a, an alignment of incentives in that, you know, there's not like money going up front to the company, but only money earned as companies actually issue equity through exactly. the platform. So, yeah. so I agree on, mm -hmm. on that aspect. I think that uh, there is a nice alignment. But, but what about, for example, key parameters of the platform? Like, there's now this uh, it's three and two percent fees that are being charged to companies. Can you guys change that at kind of at will, or or is there some kind of governance mechanism there? Yeah. So there is a provision that we would uh, that we would be that we can change that. Uh, we always need to ask the Neumark holders what they think, um, and uh, and you know that was important to have this kind of provision because we need to look a little bit at the market as well, right? So you know as there might be, I don't know, a competitor that is going to offer a better deal or something, right? Or, or we might need to optimize something or even maybe increase or decrease the fees. So this kind of mechanism has to be there. Yeah. Okay, but then, so then there is a mechanism as well. Are you guys building also governance into it so that Neumark holders would actually vote on... They would, yeah, they would influence the decision, yeah. So, you know, we need to, here one needs to be, you know, of course, very careful because, of course, there's also like a speculation aspect and so on. And, if this, you know, this is such a sensitive decision, you know, like if you take this decision wrongly, uh, for example, there's a competitor that, you know, takes only 1%, let's say. And let's say, you know, your shareholders, 
I don't know, start to behave strategically and they say, or even this competitor's purchasing, you know, from them, you know, a lot of Neumarks, right? Then you may, you can very easily end up in a situation where the company is simply off the market because it's unable to make a competitive decision, right? So right now the way it works is that, you know, we're taking this decision, Fifth Force is taking this decision, but it's influenced by the community. So we're going to ask the community, uh, of course, because this is also influencing them. Yeah. So what kind of cost would this process entail for a company? On our platform, it's just a success fee. Okay, but what about, uh, I mean, if, if we now, okay, so, so we have to create this prospectus, you know, probably have, I don't know, you get just some do this lawyers. Over to, you, don't, you don't pay anything for that. But what about time, in terms of time? How much time do you think it would take somebody? Uh, to create a prospectus? depends on the complexity of the project, right? You need to describe your business, but it's uh, if you know everything, then it costs you as much time as um, doing a startup pitch deck or writing a white paper or something like that. It's really very Okay, so, so, that, yeah. so it literally is that easy to do an IPO in Germany? Like you have a prospectus, that's it? I mean, let's say now the no, no. I mean, you know, the there's XP. well, you know, IPO in Germany might be more difficult because you know certain uh, DAX, for example, has its own requirements that are you know are exceeding the regulatory requirements, right? So if you want to go to DAX, then it's a, that is a whole different story. But if you want to uh, you know comply with the uh, with the laws with just the laws, then you know then we would we would of course as I as I said we would handhold you so you know depending on what round you want to raise, how much money and so on, we would kind of guide you through this process of configuring the proper offer and the proper perspectives. But yeah, I mean this is that's it. And and so this is in Germany, right? Now you guys are excluding uh, US investors at this point. Yeah, th just because the situation in the US is uh is very unclear, right? So we actually, we, we, we don't have to in a way to do this, but we feel safer to do this this way at the moment, so. Okay, and, and what about US companies? Could like a US company do this through the platform and just sell equity to non-US citizens, residents? Well, yes, but we initially won't do US companies. We won't do US incorporated companies um, for now. That's because the U.S. law is just really so much different than anything else. The U.S. securities law is different and also is structured in a way that it is, you know, encompassing the whole, um, kind of influences the whole world, right? <laughs> so, you know, to reduce our own complexity, we want to stay away from this uh, for now. And we also think that, you know, that there is enough market out there and there is enough, um, enough companies um, that could use that first. So we're going to do this in a later phase. Okay, cool. But, but so still, like, so we have the U.S. is out, right, both in companies mm -hmm. and at least for the time being. But then a any other company in the world, I mean, maybe you exclude some kind of uh, sanctioned country. So but let's say if yes. you, yeah. any other country, any other investor can use this without... Yeah, so, so the investors need to go through the KYC once they, not, not, you know, not in the ICBM process, but for the ETO, yes, they need to go through a KYC, of course, and you don't want to have any money that you don't know the source of to acquire legal shares in companies, right? That should not be possible um, on ethical level and any other level. So, um, but yeah, in principle, yes, this is, this is working for all jurisdictions that we have researched so far. So, so this means you know, more or less Western world style jurisdiction. So the concept of share must be there. It shouldn't be some strange religious law. It shouldn't be some, you know, a sanctioned country and so on. It needs, to, it needs to have a concept of a share that you can actually change into a token in the law. You know, for a number of cases, when you configure your agreement, we're going to have like a, you know, like a... Um, like a tool to configure it simply. But if you want to have a more complicated smart contract, a more complicated token, maybe, you know, combined with utility token and so on, some coding might be required, right, to, to do like a proper smart contract um, or additional smart contract to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and so how does this process look like from the perspective of people, like angel investors who invested in a company before they did an ETO. So let's let's imagine like there's a company in Italy. It had a set of 10 angel investors and now this Italian company does an ETO. Mm -hmm. 
and the the tokens that are ETO'd are liquid, but the original shares are not. So whether the the token in the ETO is liquid or not is the choice of the entrepreneur, right? So this is very important to say because now we're very used to secondary markets and exchanges in our crypto world. But uh, but you know, but the entrepreneurs in companies sometimes they don't want to be publicly traded because this is you know a whole new set of things that you need to take care of, right? Um, or may, they may choose, you know what, we want to be publicly traded in a few weeks or something or months from now and so on. So, so we are not forcing this, you know, with an, with an equity token, you can be liquid, but you can also, and this can also be in your smart contract, uh, you can just block the trade. Okay, this is up to the entrepreneur. It is offered, it's transparent, and then the investors, of course, decide whether they want to invest in a token that is not tradable. So that's, uh, the, the, this, is, this is how it works, it's the choice of the entrepreneur himself so in in this whole regulatory piece uh, is everything clear as day or are there aspects that you yourself are uncertain about today you know we didn't want to build any you know like workarounds with like strange offshore jurisdictions and things like this because this is you know this this is difficult to handle and also i think that the regulatory space around tokens is so fluid that you know if you go to some offshore jurisdiction or somewhere suddenly the law may change right it is not changing all the time so we didn't want to risk anything like this then you have a shareholders agreement with them as a founder if you want to buy some bitcoin on kraken then you go through a very lengthy kyc procedure um, and this is true for more, most exchanges because we're all obliged and regulated to do it this way um, and also you know in particular, after the July SEC announcement, right from the from the U.S. supervisory uh, financial supervisory, um, it the, there is an interpretation, or I could think that you know that suddenly all the exchanges in America that were trading or are still trading utility tokens, they unknowingly were actually trading securities. The result is that. You know, I guess on American exchanges, I have seen almost no new coins since July, right? Um, because you know they 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 are not licensed to trade securities, so they do not accept any new coins to list. Um, and I know for a fact that many of them are trying to obtain these licenses right now. So you know what is going to change uh, very soon is that ex- we're going to see a lot of exchanges that are going to be able to trade securities. That's simply where this market is going. So, like in in theory, uh, if and when equity tokens start working on blockchains, this is an enormous opportunity for cryptocurrency exchanges, right? Because they started as cryptocurrency exchanges, now they are handling uh, shares, and ultimately, who knows? Like, if if this technology succeeds on a massive scale in twenty years, mm-hmm. uh, like not just Neufund, but everything else that comes, then yeah. this could be the global stock market of the world. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, this is the global, you know, this is the global stock market of the world. And I know for a fact, I'm actually not sure if I can disclose it, but you know, let me just say it that you know, I know for a fact that the major exchanges are looking at that and getting licenses as we speak. Okay, so I know that for a fact we're looking at many of those because, of course, for us it was essential to find like a secondary markets for those equity tokens. Uh, yes, for sure, and. Uh, um, how beautiful is that? <laughs> but of course, if you're if you're an exchange, if you're a cryptocurrency exchange today, yes, you have this huge opportunity in front of you that you might be able to very seamlessly offer, sec- like not seamlessly, but offer securities, and those securities could grow and grow and grow. Uh, those list of securities. But on the other side, you have this decentralized exchange technology threat that maybe all of these tokens on on blockchains may not need exchanges at all. Yeah, I mean, this is something that, you know, for me, to be honest, is difficult to wrap my head around because, you know, that the today, the way it works is that the centralized exchanges kind of escaped the regulation uh, or some regulation and um, because they, they kind of are more like facilitators of peer-to-peer transactions, right? Um, and this is regulated completely differently. Don't grill me on that because I do not know the details of it and I guess many lawyers would, you know, would, would uh, would have difficulty to understand how to how to do that, but but what you know as common sense, what is a bit difficult for me to imagine is that uh, is is that is that you know that the, not only the regulator but you know the law as an as, 
as a set of rules that we as humanity want to operate within would allow an existence of some kind of gray market for real securities just because it technically works different. Um, so I think some kind of regulation should be there as well, because otherwise, you know, this could, you know, if there is equity tokens or actually securities registered real securities, real money, real connected to the real world, right? Um, and they can be traded or operated with it some market where any kind of money, including black money or terrorist money, could be potentially allowed. I don't think that this is something we should. I don't think this is this is going to hold, right? Oh, it will be super messy in the beginning. Uh, yeah, but. Um, I don't know, you know, I somehow, <laughs> I actually believe that we're going to solve it because all of this is moving faster than, than one thinks, you know, so. So what's the timeline for Neufond? Uh, what can you tell us about kind of the biggest uh, events and dates that are, you know, coming up or? Yeah, Christmas. This is going to be the time for holiday that we're all looking forward to. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, the late Q1, uh, we're going to do our first uh, ETOs already. And before that, you're going to, of course, see some, you know, uh, launch on the platform. You're going to be able to look at the product because Neufund platform actually is almost ready. I mean, there's still some stuff to do, but we're almost ready to do ETOs. And we're heading for a uh, late Q1 for that. Yeah, and I guess maybe you should add also that right now there's still this initial capital building <laughs> mechanism going on, it's right? It's still going on, yes. It's still going on. It's going to be going on for a month. And yes, this month you're also going to see some uh, cool announcements because there is really, really, really cool people joining in. Um, yeah, and it's going to be going until mid-December. And after that, um, and after that, we are getting ready for the first details already. So, so Q1 first ETOs. Now, are, are there some uh, interesting features that you guys are planning? Uh, or, you know, what's the feature set that you guys are launching with in Q1? Well, you will be able as a... So, first of all, the, the first companies that we're going to ETO with, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, we're kind of going to do this the almost incubated environment, you could say. So it's not like we're going to open the platform and anyone can ETO because this, you know, has a huge potential for explosion. So the first ETOs, there's going to be just a few first ones, like companies that agreed to test it with us, the brave new, the, the brave guys. Um, and the feature set is, yes, you can... Um, you know, configure your token, your equity token. You can launch it as a propose it, propose the investors to buy it. Investors can purchase it with Ether or with Euro. They can manage this investment. So there's like a dashboard and you see how many ETOs you have, how much Euro or Ether you have to spend uh, on the platform and um, and um, yeah, and, and how many tokens of what companies do you have? And of course, also how many know what's your ownership of the ecosystem? And then after that, uh, there is also for the for the founder, there's like a cap table manager, you could say. So, uh, you know, you will have many shareholders. So you will, as an entrepreneur, so you will want to, for example, the shareholders resolution, I don't know, I don't know, whatever. Um, you want to exit the company, for example, right? You need the consent of your shareholders. So there's going to be also smart contract governed um, um, cap table manager. Right, where you will be able to do those. And this is like the very first initial feature set for us. Cool, that's exciting. Well, Zoe, thanks so much for coming on. It's a pleasure talking with you and about this uh, you know, very exciting project. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, so we're of course going to link to some of the resources to have a comprehensive white paper and a shorter, uh, more digestible. Uh, light, light paper, paper. <laughs> yes, as well. And yeah, so if you want to check that out, you can do that. And yeah, thanks so much to our listener for once again tuning in. Uh, we're going to be back next week. In the meantime, if you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving a review for us or you can also make a donation if you'd like to. So yeah, thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you again next week.